in my sister's class this morning on near-death experiences, we were studying an experience by a doctor who grew up in India. He was Hindu, and he had an experience of God and was confronted by a light which took the form of Jesus Christ, a young man uh, with brown hair and blue eyes and a white robe, and he said to him, this Hindu man said to him, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus Christ, your Savior. Praise be to God. Praise to our Lord Jesus Christ. This is our scripture today from the glorious gospel of Luke. Jesus said to the disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap. They have no storehouse or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than the birds? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So do not be afraid, little flock. He said, do not be afraid little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> I went to the doctor this week, my regular doctor, and uh, I was sitting on my walker over here, which I use much of the time these days for the last three months, ever since something in my left knee went snap. And she came in, and uh, I wanted her to see that I was sitting there on my walker. I wanted her to see that we needed to do something for this boy. And I said to her, thinking I would get extraordinary degree of sympathy. She's a wonderful person. I'm on my walker most of the time these days. She said, congratulations. She said, most, a lot of people have too much pride to use one of those things. I said, well, I don't let pride get in the way. I said, I really can't get around very well without it. I said, uh, I'm hoping today we can find some way to get me off of it. I said, I have to preach sitting on a chair on Sunday mornings. She said, how does that go? I said, well, it goes all right. Just makes me look a little shorter. And I said, I can't get up into the great pulpit, although I probably will again someday, children, even if I sit on a stool in the great pulpit. I said, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, we can find a way for me to have, uh, have knee replacement. I have this blood clot thing. She hasn't wanted me to have knee replacement. <clears throat> she looked at me a little disgruntled, and she said, you're 81, you know. Well, I already knew that. This was not new information for me. She said, I don't know anyone over 80 who has had knee replacement. Well, now I think that's probably not true, but she was getting a little, a little fussy anyway, so I didn't push, push her on it. And um, I said, well, 
what about physical therapy? She said, I'll refer to you to someone who will give you physical therapy. She said, it won't help your knee situation, but it'll make you stronger. I said, well, that sounds good. So it looks like, um, it looks like I will not, it looks like I'm going to have to give up the marathon racing. No more of that. And to tell you the truth, I had been a little, oh, nonplussed, whatever that word means, uh, a little put down, <laughs> a little dreary, Oh, go ahead and go there, a little depressed. Oh, go ahead and go there. I had been depressed about my situation, okay? Uh, and I was ashamed of myself for it because I was somewhere the other day and I saw, I saw a kid in a wheelchair and I thought how stupid of me to be down about having to use a walker. But I said, you know, I'm still working. I'm still preaching the gospel and I would really like to be able to... Uh, I would like to be able to to walk better. And uh, when I got home from the doctor that night, at night when I say my prayers, I I usually pray mostly for other people. I pray for Bill and for Mac and for other dear people that I love who are not feeling well these days. And uh, but this night, I prayed for me. I said, uh, Lord, I'm not really happy with this situation, and you know, I've really, I've really gotten behind on a lot of stuff. I mean, there's a pile of clothes next, the Lord knew this, I didn't tell him this, he knows it all. There's a pile of dirty clothes next to my bed because that's the easiest place to throw them. And there's a pile of stuff on my desk that I haven't gotten to yet. And a lot of things that I've needed to do, I haven't done. And sometimes when I sit down, because sitting is, well, it's really nice. It's one of the nicest things I do. I sit longer than I should when I should be up doing something. I said to the Lord, I would like to think that I could get out of this doldrum that I'm in by myself. I mean, I am a preacher of your gospel, and I know all about your love, and I wish that just knowing that I could get out of this by myself, but I'm going to confess to you that I don't know that I can. So I'm asking you to help me do whatever you want to lift me from where I am. Now listen, when you pray this prayer, that's when you need to start, you need to start watching and you need to start listening. Because when you pray that prayer, the answer is going to come and you don't want to miss it. Because our God is there, our God is real, our God is responsive, our God loves us. So start looking and start listening. <laughs> oh, lately I've been having the most horrible dreams. There was one in which I was... Uh, trying to get ready for church, and I couldn't find anything. The only thing I was in, I was in the choir office for some reason. That used to be my office 40 years ago. And I was only wearing my shorts, and the service was about to come, and I couldn't find either my clothes or my robe. And I thought, I can't go out there like this. You know those dreams. I used to have classroom dreams. Now I have church dreams when I'm feeling unprepared or put upon. Well, anyway, that night after I prayed, I had, uh, <laughs> had a couple of extraordinarily lovely prayers. 
In the first one, I was, uh, my sister and I both actually were on a road trip with our father, who was played by Eddie Albert. Yeah. And it was a long road trip. I mean, I could kind of see it in my mind. I knew it just went way off into the distance. Now, you already need to start interpreting this father as neither my own earthly father nor Eddie Albert. Okay, this this father we are going to understand, I think, is that father, the heavenly father, okay? So I, we were on a road trip with our father, and this uh, it was like a color movie. And I was both in there as a little boy, and my sister, a little girl, and uh, and we were, I was both in it and I was watching it. And I also, for the most part, already knew what was going to happen, you see. I knew what was going to happen. We were, I could see where the road trip was going. But we were going to take a side venture. We were going to go to Wonderland. It's kind of like a big amusement park, all right? Uh, but the entrance to Wonderland is kind of like that hole that was an uh, entrance to, uh, uh, what was it? Alice in the Wonderland, yeah, Alice in Wonderland went through a rabbit hole to get there. Well, we went through uh, this lady's garage. On our road trip, uh, our father parked the car in a driveway, and this was the entrance to Wonderland, and it was through the garage, and there was a nice lady there to greet us, played by Angela Lansbury, okay? And we got out of the car, and we were going uh, into the through the garage, and then a little bit through the house, and then we came up to the entrance to Wonderland. And I noticed as I looked at the side of the door that Wonderland was made of uh, like a heavy cardboard. It was all bright and beautiful, but it was all kind of like a facade like it wasn't quite real, you know. Uh, we were real, uh, the father and the children and Angela Lansbury, but this didn't look real, and it was a little bit grubby. You're supposed to say wonderful things in there, though, wonderful things, and I was excited about it. We went through the door into Wonderland, and the first thing we saw was uh, a cat, which was a magical cat who could jump and at the same time look exactly like a rabbit. Well, I looked at the cat, and the cat walked by in front of me. I thought, well, I didn't see anything. It just looked like a cat to me. So uh, it looked like Wonderland was going to have some disappointments. It was insubstantial and not quite all that I might have hoped it would be. And I knew that in a moment we were going to leave Wonderland after we had looked around at what was there and get back in the car with our father and continue, continue the road trip. Well, it's not hard to figure out that uh, the road trip is this journey that we're all on, isn't it? with our Heavenly Father. And Wonderland, well, that's where we are. <laughs> it's real enough, I guess, but it's not the real thing. We have a life outside of this and above this. And as I was waking up from that dream, and the reason I was waking up, I was receiving a higher calling to the bathroom. As I woke up from that dream, I, uh, I, I thought, well, you know, that was a wonderful dream because there were absolutely no worries and there was no fear because I knew everything that was going to happen. I knew the story. And the, and the, the thought came to me, if you know the story that you are in, you don't worry. You know what's going to happen. And I knew that the road trip went on. So I got back from the bathroom, went immediately back to sleep, and had 
another beautiful dream. It was a classroom dream. You teachers know about classroom dreams. When I was a student, I used to have classroom dreams. This was when I was a student, and I was always at North Texas, and uh, for years after I went to North Texas, I would be, it would be the last day of class, and I had forgotten until just before the class started. I had never opened the book. It was final exam, and it was a math class. And I was running across the campus to try to get there before the class started, although it seemed hopeless anyway. Now, that's a, you, how many of you had a dream similar to that? Okay, you have. I know you have. It's a classic dream. As a teacher, I used to have teacher dreams. They become church dreams now, like I expressed earlier. I'd have a class. The class was so disruly, I couldn't even get them to settle down. I was not prepared for the lesson. That's, that's the classroom dream. Well, I had for the first time in my life a beautiful classroom dream. It was, there were students there who were just absolutely wonderful. I think they were seniors, and it was senior literature, the emphasis still on story. And I was telling them we were going to read some really wonderful stories in this class. And I said, stories are so important, and we're going to read some great ones. Well, it was a little bit later that one of the students in that class, who was actually an older guy, about 60, who had gone back to high school to finish his education, although he was quite a successful businessman already. And he came up to me and he said, uh, you know, Mr. Brennan, remember, remember how teachers get respect? If you're a preacher, it's, hey, you. He said, he said Mr. Brennan, uh, you said something the other day that was very important to me. He said, my life was just falling apart. Nothing was going right. He said, I was just in despair. But he said, you just in passing expressed your philosophy of life. Remember you said that whatever happens to you in life, you just get up and go on and don't ever get discouraged because the trajectory of life is toward victory and joy. <laughs> well, is that my philosophy of life? <laughs> That's the gospel that I preach. I've said it enough. I guess that is my philosophy of life. That is what God would have me know. What? You shouldn't be surprised that I woke up the next morning in an extraordinarily good mood. Because this is the truth of life. We are here in this situation. I don't think we entered through Angela Lansbury's garage, but we're here in this situation. We're, 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 go, we're going to have difficulties. What is our job in the face of extraordinary difficulties? Well, if we can't run, we will walk. And if we can't walk, we'll get in a chair and roll. And if we can't get in a chair and roll, we'll get down on the floor and crawl. And if we can't crawl, we'll depend on the Lord to pick us up and carry us the rest of the way because we have the guarantee that we are on this journey. And there is nothing in God's great heaven or God's wonderful earth that can stop us. So we keep going and we trust in the Lord. Whatever happens to us, there's no ending to our story. And if you know the story you are in, and we are all in this story, this ongoing story, we are in it.
Ain't nothing going to stop it. God's always going to be loving us. God's always going to be watching us. We're always going to be more important than those birds he talked about. And his word is always going to be us. Don't be afraid and do not worry. Because I've got you. I've got you now. I've got you through the future. So you can do whatever you can do and do the best you can at it at whatever speed you can go. But I am your strength. I am your Savior. And he says to us, I will get you there. Remember in the dream, I was just a child. And it was the father who was doing the driving. It's when we try to get in the driver's seat, we get in trouble. Let God lead us. He knows where we're going. We know where we're going. And one way or another, we're going to be safe and in his care. I know it doesn't always look like it and it doesn't always feel like it and things are not going to go the way we want them to. But we are always in his care. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are forever. Join me in prayer. God of grace and glory, we thank you that when we call upon your holy name, you are there for us as we are, however we may be feeling, you are there. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.